Hello everyone, how are we doing today? And welcome to today's video. So today we're going into the next video in chapter seven, which is on the chi-square test of independence. So this is a, a really important test. It We've talked about linked genes, incomplete linkage, and complete linkage up until this point, but how do we determine if something's linked or it can assort independently? That's what this test does. So it's called the chi-square test of independence. And if you forget what chi-square it is, I definitely recommend going back to, I believe it was in chapter three, you could check the genetics playlist or something called chi-squared analysis, um, where we went over chi-square, just typical Mendelian inheritance. So the testing if genes, you know, sort independently and things like that. So now we're taking that one step further and looking at it compared to linked genes. Uh, so here, this is testing for independent assortment and linkage. So let's say two genes are pretty far apart on the same chromosome. So, you know, we have gene A and gene B down here. They're pretty far apart. And let's say this recombination frequency, so RF is equal to like 45%. That's getting very, very close to acting like a gene that sorts independently, which would be 50%. So how does this 45%, is this, does that 45% mean these genes are linked? Or do they, is it acting like it's independent assortment? Is it within that error? And that's where you want to use something like this. So if genes are further apart, you can use these and you use something called a contingency table, which I have up here in a title to work through these problems. And the best way to do these and understand these is to go through an example and how to make a contingency table and so forth. So here's the example I'm uh, using today. I get member the slashes that represents a notation to write these. Uh, so here we have Y plus CV plus. So both C and V are talking about the same allele, just two letters to use it. So you see that commonly with things like Drosophila, which is something we'll be talking about a lot when it comes to linked genes, because that's where the initial maps were made. Uh, so here we have Y plus CV plus, y plus represents wild type again, and Y CV, which is the recessive. So right here we have, you know, if you'd write this, you know, the old school way, it's, you know, a heterozygous form of this gene cross the homozygous recessive form. And here are the results of this cross. So this is what the cross would look like. Just this is the notation we like to use for doing these types of cross. So here are the results 63 uh, of this one here. So Y plus Y, Y plus Y, CV plus CV. This one is a non-recombinant. Again, always label your non-recombinants and recombinants. It helps you a little bit later, and it's good to get in a habit of it. And then here's another non-recombinant. So this is the double uh, recessive or homozygous recessive, not double recessive. Then these two are the recombinants. So it's always good just to label those. Even if you don't need them, it helps you visualize what's happening here. And you think these are recombinants. Now, if you look at these numbers, 63, uh, 28, 33, 77, you can see that the non-recombinants are each above 50% and the recombinants are less than 50%. So looking at this right now, you can make the statement by just looking at these numbers that there should be, you know, gene linkage at play here. If independent assortment was at play, these numbers would be closer to these numbers. And, you know, so, but we need to do this table here to actually get our results to figure out why. So we make something called a contingency table. Now, this is probably something we haven't seen yet, and I'm not going to go into details, you know, how this was de derived or where it comes from, but it helps us do this analysis. So remember the essence of chi-squared is you're taking the observed, so right here is the, are the observed numbers of progeny, comparing it with the expected. And this contingency table helps you calculate the expected which is you know tough to do if you're just giving this, these outcome numbers. So here we use this to calculate the expected. And the way we fill this in, we look at the results of each of these combinations. It's kind of like a multiplication table. So Y plus Y, CV plus CV, that's this one right here. So that's 63. Um, y, Y, CV plus CV, that's this one right here. So that's 33. And then you fill in the rest. So this one's then 28. And then this one's 77. Okay. Now what happens? So over here, this is the row total. So you add these along the row. Then over here, this is column total. So then you add the columns coming down. 
So row totals up here, this one would equal 96. So 63 plus 33, 28 plus 77 is 105. 63 plus 28, 91. And then here we have 110. Okay. Now, what else do we do? Right here, this is the grand total. So, you know, expected, you got to divide it by the total number of what you expect. So if you add these up, each of these is equal to 201. This is one way you can check your work. So 96 plus 105, 201, and 91 plus 110 is also 201. If they don't equal, you know you did something wrong in the middle part of this table here. So it's one way you can check yourself. All right. So now that's step one is just making this little contingency table. Step two is you want to calculate the expected values for each. So if genes sort independently, and that's what we're testing for, whether or not these genes sort independently. If they don't sort independently, we know they're linked. So we need the expected. Uh, expected is equal to the row total times the column total divided by the grand total. So we're going to have four different ones here. So E for the first one here. So row total. So our row total is 96 times the column total for 91. And again, let's say we're, we're looking at this one right here right now. This is the one we're looking at. So 96 times 91, the so 96, 91. And then you divide that by the grand total, which is 201. And this equals 43.5. And I'll do one more here. So you do one for each of these. So next one, let's make it red. Uh, that's not red. <laughs> this is red. So let's do the 33 here. So for 33, we have 96 and 110. And then the next one will be for 105 and 91. So this one right here, let's make it this color here of this brown color. And what's our result then? So 105 times 91 over 201 is equal to 47.5. Then the last one will be this one right here, which let's make that one blue. The 105, 91 divided by 201. I meant 105, 110 divided by 201. And that equals 57.5. Actually, uh, I'm going to change these numbers here to make them match the colors up here because it'll help us see this a little better coming up in the next step. There we go, much better. So now you can see the color coding we have here. Again, this will help us moving forward because remember, this green here represents Y plus Y, CV plus CV, or you know this one right here, even though I just drew that arrow in blue. Um, so now that's step two. There's our calculated or our expected value. So we expect 43.3 Y plus Y, CV plus CV, but we got 63. So if these sort independently, these are our expected numbers. So that's kind of cool to think about, um, that if there's independent assortment, this is what there should be, what each ratio should be. So kind of neat. And that's based on these results. So now we ca calculate our chi-square value. So remember, the equation for chi-squared is equal to the summation, it's a summation sign, of the observed minus the ex expected divided by the expected. And this is also why I drew, I color coded this because it'll help you fill in the next part. So green with green, these are all your expecteds and these are all your observed. So for this one, we'd have four different summations. Now I'm not gonna change the colors for this one here and I'll do the first one and then I'll just autofill the rest. So the first one we're looking at is 63 is the observed in green, expected is 43.5. That's squared divided by the total now, well, not a total divided by the expected, which is again, 43.5. Boom. So now we do this for the rest. So this one observed for the red. So we have 33 minus 52.5 squared divided by 52.5. We then do that for the rest. I'm just going to fill it all in real quick. Alrighty. And we're filled in. I also added the color code lines underneath to help separate it as well. So if you're lost here, just look at the colors and uh, scroll up here and you can see where these came from. So now this gives us a chi-squared 
if you plug all this in, of 30.73. So 30.73 is our chi-squared value. Okay, cool, we're gonna need that for later. Next, we have to determine our degrees of freedom. So now, degrees of freedom we also talked about back during Mendelian inheritance for determining de degrees of freedom is a number of possible outcomes minus one. Similar kind of idea here, but it's the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. Now we kept it simple. We did, you know, two, two genes here. And so number of rows, two minus one times two minus one. I'll write it out. So two minus one times two minus one, of course, is one. So we have one degree of freedom here. And most of these that we're going to be talking about just are going to have one degree of freedom. Okay, so now is when we do the analysis. So we compare the chi-squared value of 30.73 to the critical value table. So remember, this is the same table we used before. Uh, so this is a table of critical value. So we're looking at 30.73 is our chi-squared value at one degree of freedom. Now let's look at our table. So here we're at uh, one degree of freedom. And we look down here, these are our critical values. So anything between that range, 90 to 97.5%. We're at 30.73, so that's way above this. So this is much, much greater than um, here. Oops. Yeah, much, much greater than. So the way we write that, so this um, p-value right here is 0 0.005. So we make this statement 30.70.73 at one degree of freedom is much greater than the critical value, you know, much greater than the critical value at P is equal to 0 0.005. Remember P of 0 0.005, that's 0.5% chance. So you can also state this differently in sentence form. So it's less than uh, 0.5% chance that genes sort independently. So, kind of neat. If you think about it, what does that mean? So that means you know these genes were pretty sure, you know, a greater than 95, 99.5% chance that these genes are linked would be another way to say that. Um, so, very, very sure that these are you know linked genes based on this and now you know everything comes down to statistics probability and statistics when it comes to genetics and heritability and all this stuff so being able to express something in terms of a p-value and you know chance is very important when analyzing all of this but yeah i i hope you understood what i was talking about today i know you know math no one ever likes math but if you're studying elsewhere and checking this video i hope you enjoyed it and if you have any questions definitely let me know i'll keep an eye on comments and things like that and good luck on your studies and going forward now we're going to be moving on into uh you know genetic mapping link genes two point test crosses will be first and then three point test crosses and we'll be on that for a little bit of time all right that's all i have for today uh Hope you have a great day and see you all next time. Bye-bye.